Zoe, Zoe Aliozzi. I'm your biggest fan, and you have inspired me greatly to follow climate justice as an academic and as an advocacy field. So I'm in debt for your work, for your commitment, for your uh, morals, for your ethics, and for your drive in promoting climate justice. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. But Manfred <laughs> will, will welcome you uh, in today. Yes, uh, it's really a big honor, Mary, to have you with us. Um, uh, for those who don't know that well, uh, you have a very, very long and distinguished career, and I still remember very much the case of Norris um, yeah. uh, versus uh, Ireland, which was one of the, the first cases, actually, uh, where the European Court of Human Rights recognized uh, sexual orientation uh, as a distinguishing feature that is highly problematic and uh, you were winning the case, you were the, uh, the human rights defender and also legal activist uh, and uh, it was a strategic litigation also uh, that made you very famous long before you became the first woman to be elected president of Ireland uh, but our cooperation started very much at a time when you were elected the second United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and you did a marvelous job. Uh, we worked uh, in many ways uh, together. I think uh, uh, that you were making the office uh, a, a great office uh, as, a, as a main speaker for human rights in the United Nations. And that is also the time when we cooperated very closely on poverty reduction strategies uh, and many, many other issues. Um, but that was the time when we founded the European Master's Program in Human Rights and Democratization and you were uh, often coming uh, to Venice. Uh, you were a friend from the beginning, uh, uh, being there with our graduation ceremonies and uh, uh, you are our first honorary president. Uh, you know the second one is Chide Kenja, your former uh, direct advisor in your function and uh, Chide also says his best regards. Um, so you are the two uh, honorary presidents and uh, he became that after he served as president of the Global Campus, perhaps to explain to you when you were appointed honorary president, we were still called European Inter-University Center for Human Rights, but uh, we moved in the meantime, we changed our name to Global Campus of Human Rights, which is a network of 100 universities and seven master programs in all world regions. And we would be extremely honored also to once see you again here in Venice at one of our graduation ceremonies or other major events that uh, we are doing. Finally also I still remember very vividly that you were together with Paolo Sergio Pinheiro co-chairs of the panel of eminent persons instituted by the Swiss government to develop an uh, agenda for human rights for the next years. Um, and I had the honor to be rapporteur and member of this panel. Um, and of course now you are, as Zoe said already, uh, extremely active uh, in the issue of climate justice, which we consider to be the biggest challenge of the 21st century that needs to be addressed. I'm happy to see you uh, being very, very active uh, in, in this position. Um, and I look forward to the discussions that you will have uh, with our students here in Venice, whether in this room or in uh, being online, etc. Uh, we need to have these uh, restrictions because of COVID-19. Thank you so much and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Manfred. It's al always good to see you and hear you again and uh, have your reflections on some of the work we did together in the past. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, the students are taking part in seminars on climate justice 
as part of your European Master in Human Rights and Democratization. Uh, uh, because I feel that we underestimate the importance of climate justice. In fact, when I started my foundation um, in 2010, it was very much, uh, sorry, um, yeah, 29, 2009, it was very much a niche issue. You know, very few people were talking about it. And it was thought to be either very left or, you know, radical. And uh, I, I was actually encouraged, you know, if you have a foundation, don't call it climate justice, call it something else. And I said, no, I'm a human rights person. I came to understanding the link between climate change and human rights through the lens of human rights when I worked in African countries on economic and social rights, I'm going to call it climate justice. And I'm glad that since then, uh, climate justice has gone mainstream in a sense, but I think we still underestimate its importance. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that in my uh, introductory words, and then I'm very happy to answer the questions. I saw uh, some very interesting questions that you were putting forward as students, and I'd be very happy to uh, respond to those in the time we have available. But let me come back to the importance of climate justice. I was witness to that when I had my mandate as the special envoy of the UN Secretary General before the Paris Climate Agreement. It gave me an opportunity to be oh, present at a whole range of meetings, including additional informal ministerial meetings that the French government uh, French presidency of the COP had decided uh, to organize. And they decided this because there wasn't agreement uh, before Paris on what the goal would be that we would try to achieve in Paris. Because small island states, least developed countries, uh, indigenous peoples all wanted 1.5 degrees to be in the text. And this was being opposed by quite a right, wide range of countries. So we had all these informal meetings on that issue and some other issues. And I heard Tony de Brum saying over and over again, do you really want my small atolls, the Marshall Islands, to go under and no longer be a sovereign people? Do you want us to have to migrate and just be a collection of people in another country with no sovereignty? Is that what you want? And he kept repeating more or less um, that message. And I think it got into the ear of a lot of the ministers who were listening. And when we got to Paris, uh, you know, literally at the start, which was the high level meeting, uh, India was still opposing, and so were some other countries, the idea of 1.5 degrees getting into the text. And during the conference itself, during the Paris conference, there was a high ambition coalition formed, and its leader was Tony de Brum of the Marshall Islands. But he persuaded the European Union, the United States, and a number of other countries to join, and their top goal was to get the goal of Paris to reflect 1.5 degrees. And uh, we marched in the street. Some of you may recall, we marched in the street in Paris, 1.5 to stay alive. And then we did get that goal of staying well below two degrees and working for 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial standards. That was new. So new that the scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had not studied it. So the Paris Climate Agreement asked the IPCC, is there a difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees of warming? And if we have to stay at 1.5 degrees, what does this mean? And the IPCC studied this. And then in October, 2018, as you'll recall, brought out their special report on 1.5 degrees of warming. And in it, they said, yes, there is a very big difference between 1.5 and two degrees. And I'm simplifying the report, but it's in the report. They made it clear that in that time, very bad things might happen. The coral reefs might disappear. The Arctic ice might melt entirely. And the permafrost might melt and throw up not just carbon, but also methane, which, as we know, is more lethal in the short term. So the advice of the scientists was the whole world needs to stay at not, not go above 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial standards. And they said, this is doable if you have the political will, and it means you have to reduce carbon emissions by 45% by uh, 2030. And this, this opened up 
a whole new uh, debate because it had begun in Paris, the idea of uh, being net zero by 2050. And I actually took part with a number of business leaders um, in a meeting in Davos 11 months before Paris, the B team of business leaders made a commitment to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and do it the climate justice way because I had influenced them to that extent. And that was completely new. I remember Christiana Figueres, who was in charge of the COP at that time, uh, that was to, to, be, to be in Paris, being so impressed. And then we got a whole lot of countries and a whole lot of business saying, we'll be at net zero by 2050. And people got a bit annoyed about that because it was too far out. It wasn't very mean, meaningful. There was some greenwashing involved, etc. And we were in a tighter thing after the report of uh, the IPCC in October 2018, because we were now focused on 2030 and needed to be. How were we going to get, reduce by 45% by 2030? And then fast forward to COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, I was there in my capacity as chair of the elders, the group that Nelson Mandela brought together in 2007. Its first chair was Archbishop Tutu and then Kofi Annan until his death in August 2018. And I fill big shoes as the current chair. And uh, it was clear that uh, there was a, a real urgency among many, many participants, especially the representatives of the small island states, of the poorest countries, indigenous peoples, et cetera. But I think that urgency was more shared by a wider number of countries because the impacts of climate were being felt in the Northern hemisphere. Um, at last we were realizing it's not a problem of the future. It had not been a problem of the future for the South. It had been hit over and over again with terrible hurricanes, terrible fires, terrible drought, uh, terrible flooding. But now the Northern hemisphere was being hit. And yet we couldn't close the gap. I remember the moment when I got quite emotional in Glasgow when we heard the verdict, if you like, of the um, 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 climate um, tracker uh, report uh, that uh, if you added up everything that was committed to uh, by governments and by business and by investment in uh, uh, COP26 before and at COP26, we were still on course for a 2.4 degrees Celsius warming world. And I remember spelling out what that means. It means that for anybody um, under 60, they're very likely to face an, 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 a, a world that's you know, insufferable because of droughts, because of fires, because of flooding, because of climate shocks, worse and worse. And for anybody under 30, it's certain they would face that world. So what did we mean? I mean, what, what are we talking about? And so uh, there was a lot of anger in uh, Glasgow because we didn't fulfill the commitments. First of all, we didn't close that gap, nor did we close the adaptation gap. The fact that we uh, don't have 50% of climate money going to adaptation. We did increase the amount uh, for adaptation, but we didn't bring it anything close to the 50%. We didn't have any mechanism for loss and damage. It was actually very interesting because uh, Scotland and a number of philanthropies put up money for um, any, if, if there could be a Glasgow in finance uh, mechanism for loss and damage, it would go into that mechanism. And that mechanism was not created because of the resistance of powerful countries, because of their fear of the idea of reparations. And they don't seem to understand that in many countries that have been buffeted over the years, especially small island states, they've gone beyond adaptation. They're into loss and damage. And we have to get real about that. And I sense that there is a, a certain anger now, a certain sense of eco-colonialism, as it's sometimes called, or climate colonialism. In other words, the justice dimension has taken on an important life of its own. And those who feel that injustice most strikingly are speaking out more about it. Um, interestingly, I used to wonder why African leaders were not speaking out more about the injustice of the fact that the whole continent of Africa is responsible, I'd say, for still less than 5% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, even though it has quite big emitters within the continent in South Africa and even Nigeria and 
and, and, and some other countries, but still, overall, it's very low. And the per capita is very low, as it is in countries like India. And yet they were not speaking out on the justice dimension. They have now begun to do it. And we have to take that extremely seriously because we need solidarity and cooperation to solve the problem and to address the climate issue. And I'm going to end with the way in which I identify five layers of injustice that come together as uh, you know, spelling out the injustices of climate change. And then uh, we'll discuss your questions. The first injustice is the one that I perceived when I was working in African countries, that they were first earlier and disproportionately affected by climate change, but they weren't responsible. They weren't responsible for the emissions. And also, they were the black and brown and indigenous peoples of our world, the poorest peoples, the poorest countries, the small island states, the indigenous peoples. So there was also a racial injustice. Secondly, within that, the gender dimension, that uh, women still have to put food on the table. They have to go further in drought for uh, water or firewood. They have to be fierce activists on the ground, which so many women are. When I wrote my book on climate justice, which some of you may have seen, um, it's 11 stories, and you'll have noted that nine of them are about women um, you know, building their communities, making them more resilient. But there were also two good men. And the third injustice is the one that young climate activists have been calling us out on, and they're so right. Um, they've been pointing out the intergenerational injustice, the unfairness to them, the unfairness to you as students with most of your life to lead, um, that you carry that burden in the future of not having as yet a secure future. And the fourth injustice is a very subtle one, but it's a very important one when we come back to my earlier point about the need for justice. We have to understand the injustice of the pathways to development of different parts of the world. That industrialized countries, we built our economies on fossil fuel. And our responsibility now is to wean ourselves off rapidly and do it with just transition for the workers and communities. Pay significant money to ensure that people are pensioned off, but also that good jobs in the green economy go into communities that would otherwise be very affected by coal closing or oil and gas increasingly uh, closing down. Um, the developing countries made commitments in their nationally determined contributions before Paris. And I remember being impressed as special envoy at the time by how many of them wanted to go as green and as clean as possible. But they said, we will need the investment, we will need the training, we will need the skills transfer, we will need the intellectual property. And of course, this wasn't forthcoming in anything like the degree it should be. So that's the complex injustice that we face at COP26 and going forward. And the fifth injustice, which we're recognizing more and more, is the injustice to nature herself, the loss of biodiversity, the extinction of species. And we need to bring the two big frameworks, the COP26 and future COPs, the next COP being in Africa and Egypt, and the Convention on um, Biological Diversity, which will, I hope, take place in Kunming, whether it's in May or later in the year, in order that people can participate. Um, but these two are two sides of the one coin, and we must talk about them more and more together. And we must also talk about one more thing, but I'm not going to dwell on it, and that is the unfair access to vaccines, the lack of equity, because if if no one is no one is safe unless we're all safe and the selfishness and the way in which the european union in particular has blocked the waiver of wto rules on intellectual property in order to have widespread manufacturing of um uh, generic um um, um uh, vaccines is, is is truly shocking and truly selfish and truly immoral in my view and I'm glad that there is increasing pressure on the EU and the UK and Switzerland who are blocking the WTO. The United States is in favor. It's amazing that you know the profits of the pharma com com companies can be more important than the lives of millions and millions of people and the future of all of us because pandemics um, uh, can't be got rid of until everybody um, is able to be vaccinated. So there we are. Um, there's a big justice dimension to everything we're talking about when we talk about um, uh, uh, the 
uh, climate crisis. And that makes it a human-centered issue, a human rights-centered issue, a gender-sensitive issue, and the kind of issue that I'm glad you're doing extra seminars on. So now I'm ready for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, talk on climate justice and on the issues that you have identified, your experience and knowledge. And uh, it's, for us, it's priceless. It's, uh, so we very much appreciate it. We have collected some questions and we even had a poll uh, between our students to decide which ones uh, we're going to ask you. So one question is related to gender issues. Uh, there are a lot of students actually uh, asking, is feminism as a term, as a movement, as a philosophy, as a theory relevant to the climate justice field today? I believe it's very relevant, but I know that the word can mean different things to different people who hear it. Uh, I have a podcast that some of you may know about called Mothers of Invention, which I uh, co-host with a, a much younger Irish woman who's a successful comedian uh, based in New York. And Maeve Higgins and I started this not knowing each other beforehand. And the funny part of it is she's only half respectful of me. Uh, she was eight years old when I was elected president. And part of the humor is she teases me a lot, etc. But the byline of our um, uh, podcast is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And I always explain man-made is generic. Um, it includes all of us. We're all responsible. And a feminist solution includes as many men as possible because that's the solution that is problem solving, that is non-hierarchical, that is listening, that is the way in which many women um, in forming um, networks together solve problems, especially in their communities. Um, now, uh, I'm not saying women are better than men, that's, that's not the issue, but the issue is that the way in which women resolve issues is the modern way, and that is the feminist way. And we therefore need to uh, understand that we have to be honest about tackling the problems. If any of you listen to the podcast, you'll know in particular in the third series, when we were joined by Tamali Kodakora from uh, Kodakari from um, Sri Lanka, uh, Tamali brought a, an extra dimension. We listened to women from the South. What did they talk about? They talked about patriarchy. They talked about colonialism. They talked about capitalism not solving the issues. So they, you know, they, they voiced a lot of the concerns of how to have a different way of, 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 of acting. That, that was uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Now that you've uh, mentioned capitalism, we have a question that uh, says, can climate justice and capitalism ever be compatible? It's an interesting question because, again, the word capitalism means so many different things to different people. I mean, what I worry about is, um, you know, a state-run country. Um, where the state runs everything. We know that that can be a place where human rights are not respected. We have countries in the world where that is happening at the moment, where the state is the master and human beings are not as free as they would be. So how do we get a form of um, addressing the needs of our economy that focuses on people? That's what I'm interested in. I don't care what you call it. Um, you know, and I don't think it can be left to the state because there's so much brains and entrepreneurial skills and energy in the private sector. It's to harness that in a way that is for the common good. What we have at the moment is what I would call very rampant capitalism, um, a very unequal world. We've seen even during COVID, billionaires have got even more, you know, billionaire, richer and richer and richer. And those who are P poorer suffer more because all the costs are, are worse, they're more likely to be laid off and so on. And then you have the inequity of the access to vaccines, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a lot wrong with modern capitalism. I think we just need to think of a new um, human-centered approach to the problems that we face in a world where we don't have a certain future. Yeah, can we get our priorities right with global commons? Can we you know, address in a very different way how we will actually manage going forward to 
provide a basic income to everyone in the world. We could do that. I mean, that's what I'm interested in. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Uh, another question, because I don't want to waste uh, our time with you. It's so precious to us. So I'll go to another question immediately. Can climate litigation save the planet and the rights of future generations? What, what do you think about that? I don't think we should expect climate litigation to save the planet. That has to be a very comprehensive approach where um, very importantly, governments meet their obligations. And we have, you know, uh, governments at the moment, and I named them in, uh, in Glasgow. I'm always happy to name them. I'm not a UN person anymore. I don't have to be polite. And the main offenders at the moment are Australia, a rich industrialized country, which should be ashamed of itself that it is not moving more quickly in uh, getting out of fossil fuel. Um, countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, also China, we hoped would step up more before Glasgow, and frankly, the United States. Uh, the United States um, uh, should be paying far more in climate finance. Um, it's, it's, it's increased under uh, President Biden to 11.6 billion. Uh, estimates, uh, you know, fair estimates of what it should be paying are about 40 billion. So you see how far below it is, and it could be doing more on supporting adaptation and so on. So um, uh, that's key. So is um, investment moving more dramatically as it is moving now, but not quickly enough, um, out of fossil fuel, taking away subsidies of fossil fuel. And then we come to litigation. It has a very important role to play within its context. And we've seen the value of cases. We had a case in Ireland where um, the, the co Supreme Court found that Ireland was not meeting its obligations. We have much better climate policy now, climate legislation, and much more sense of urgency in the people because of that litigation. You've had very good litigation in Germany, uh, which was really important, in, in France, which was really important. And of course, it was the Dutch case, the Urgenda case, that started all of that. But we thought the Dutch case was going to be isolated. But it's not just a European issue. It's also in the Philippines, in India, in, uh, and in the United States, various cases that haven't yet had a successful court outing, but I'm sure it will come. So there's a lot of room for litigation, but I don't think we should ever take our eye off where the main responsibility is, which is with government and with business and with investment. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much for this comprehensive answer. Now, we don't have a lot of time, but let me just maybe close up with a more personal question, if it's possible. What are your thoughts about our own uh, you know, carbon footprint as uh, someone uh, that has been engaging in this area in, for climate justice? What advice do you have for us about dealing or managing our own carbon footprint? Well, can I answer that um, in a way that broadens it slightly but still answers it? <laughs> um, and, and this will be my last um, contribution. Uh, I always ask audiences to take at least, you know, to take the three steps that every one of us can take. And the first one is to make the climate crisis personal in your life. And that means you've got to do what your question asked. What are you doing? I've become a pescatarian, meaning I don't eat meat anymore, except I actually lapsed during COVID because I'm here with my meat eating husband who has become a sort of flexitarian. And now I've become, when I'm alone with him, more flexitarian than pescatarian, if you understand me. But when I'm out and, you know, increasingly, um, I try to do that. Um, I, we also don't have a car anymore. I take public transport. Young people in Ireland love to see me going on the bus and, you know, it's, 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 and, and the train. Um, and so you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to fly less. I'm refusing engagements when I can do it this way by Zoom, or when I just don't feel I can justify traveling for a once-off speech, say. So those are the things. So that's the first thing. Secondly, get angry about those who aren't doing enough. It's time to get angry, young people. You know, this is your world and your future. So get engaged. Join, um, you know, organizations or support the many bodies that are trying to uh, uh, make sure that we do more to support nature, conservation, whatever it is. Um, and uh, the third step is the most important one. And that is we have to imagine this world we need to be rushing towards. By 2030, which is eight years away um, from January, um, you know, come on. Uh, we, we need to see it as a world that will be much healthier. 
we won't have the fumes of fossil fuel that kill between seven and eight million people a year, many of them um, women and children because of indoor smoking, uh, smoke from cook stoves. Um, and uh, it'll be a world where cities will be green, where we'll have gardens in cities and farms in cities. Um, we'll have a countryside that will become rewilded. I mean, let's get excited about this world. And then people will want it more and begin to hurry more towards it. So um, I want to bring hope um, over this subject because climate justice can be something that you know can be a little bit uh, grim in knowing that we're not on course for a safe world. So uh, Archbishop Tutu taught me, we all have to be prisoners of hope, not optimists, but prisoners of hope. So that's my last message to you. Thank you so much. We'll keep that hope. We need the, <laughs> this hope, to be honest, like all of us. And uh, it's very interesting what you said, to imagine the possibility of a better world and even in the, our seminars, we have this practical exercise where we are imagining uh, the basic rules for a climate just uh, future world. And uh, we're trying to imagine exactly that, just to be hopeful and to be more practical in these uh, ideas. So thank you. I don't want to keep you any longer since I know you have a busy schedule. I talk up from everyone that we are very much grateful for this contribution and for everything you do for human rights and climate justice. And uh, we hope to maybe see you again here maybe or when this COVID uh, nightmare will uh, finish. Yeah, that is also my main message to you. Thank you so much for all what you said and we really hope to see you once again in Venice in your role as Honorary President of the Global Campus of Human Rights.